Many of you guys enjoy watching my videos because I try to make my analysis videos as simple as possible. I don't try to use some fancy Excel spreadsheets or anything crazy to try to sound smart. I try to use common sense more than I try to, you know, use Excel spreadsheets. And I make my analysis videos very, very understandable. Now, I have a very hard task today, and I'm going to try to value and discuss Brookfield Corporation in a shorter video frame, not 20 or 30 minutes long. And this is a company that Monish Pabrai has been buying and many other smart investors have actually been buying a Brookfield Corporation. I believe he started buying it in Q4 of 2022 and he actually added 8.5% to the position in 2023. And you have to keep in mind that it's not 20% of his portfolio because the 13F does not include his Indian holdings and other type of international holdings, but his US portfolio, it is 20%, which is in Brookfield corporation and brookfield actually has been crashing a lot since the beginning of 2022 now it's sitting at 30 dollars per share the chart looks awful it's trading at the same levels it was trading at in february and march of 2020 when the company was crashing so there might be a real opportunity here but if you ever try to look at brookfield corporation you're gonna find out that it's a very complex company it's very complicated they have a lot of subsidiaries that are, are listed in different type of tickers and they own a piece of them and they use some kind of distributed earnings and all these kind of things which makes it very very complicated and i'm sure i might be missing a thing or two in this video i might be making some mistakes but i really hope you actually appreciate all the research that i put in in doing this uh, video now to try to keep it simple brookfield owns many different subsidiaries the first one is bam brookfield asset management and most of you are familiar with this business brookfield asset management they manage 430 $32 billion of outside capital. It's not actually their own money. Maybe it's the Qatar, you know, wealth fund, sovereign wealth fund, maybe something in, in Argentina or something, I don't know, in, in Europe or in the United States or in Canada. So it's money that's actually not their own. And they invest it in many different areas. Now, why do all these countries and all these people actually come to Brookfield? They come to Brookfield because they are the only people. They actually have the expertise, they have the experience, and they have the scale to manage, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars or tens of billions of dollars. Maybe there's Blackstone and a few others, but Brookfield is really... I mean, it has pretty much a very wide moat that it's one of the only three or four players all around the world that actually can manage such amounts of money. And they have around 53 billion in renewable power and transition. They have 93 billion in infrastructure, 39 billion in private equity, $98 billion in real estate, and $149 billion in credit and others. And they collect fees on those $432 billion, which is massive, massive margins on those... Uh, on this investment but they actually do take this money and they reinvest it in those same exact projects so they actually also have their own money along with outside capital invested in those projects and they have an insurance business and a few other things so their total AUM is not 430 billion it's more like 750 billion dollars which grew over 32 percent compounded every single year since 2002 and as many upcoming countries continue to prosper something like India or something maybe in the Middle East or in Asia, uh, Brookfield is going to be attracting a lot of capital and they're going to collect a lot of fees on this capital and then they use the fees to reinvest it in their own real estate type of projects which actually benefit shareholders and it's just an amazing, amazing uh, business model. But they also have a lot of the offices and what they've been doing, they've been trying to transition them to higher quality type of you know, uh, offices. So from the class C offices, they've been selling them, they've been trying to transition them into their trophy property which they own many popular properties around the world you can look it up on google but then you also have the class a and the class b properties which actually leads me to the first and the biggest risk with brookfield that not many people are talking about most people that do analysis on brookfield they talk about the positives and how amazing this company is and how cheap it is and the moat and the oligopoly and all these kind of things but not many are actually talking that brookfield defaulted on 161 million dollar mortgage tied to a dozen 
office buildings. So that was underwritten in 2018. Brookfield faced a sharp uptick in monthly payment, where monthly payment went from 300,000 a year ago to a floating rate mortgage was 880,000 this month. And they just couldn't sustain it. The numbers didn't line up. So what happened? They defaulted. Now, why did this actually happen? It's because many of these companies, they take three to five years, I believe, fixed rate debt, and then it transitions to variable debt. But it has not been a problem since 2001, 2002, because we pretty much had zero interest rates. So when the three to five year fixed is actually up, and then you have the floating rate, what they do is they refinance it for another five or 10 years in terms of fixed rate type of debt, and they just keep refinancing it. And this is how these companies actually grew. But now interest rate went up. It went up from 0% to 5%. Mortgage rates are like eight or 9%, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So there's a massive difference that the numbers were looking good a few weeks ago, whenever they had them you know, fixed. But once they transition to variable, then the numbers, they just don't line up. They went from 300,000 to 880,000. And they actually defaulted on another type of loan in February, totaling $784 million to two trophy office towers located in Los Angeles. So they are actually facing a very big problem in terms of interest rates actually going up. They're not being able to refinance it at you know what they used to be able to, one or two percent. They're having to refinance it at higher rates as the numbers they just don't line up. So they're having to default on those properties. But the CEO did talk about this and he pretty much made an ex excuse in my opinion. And he said, when you own 7,000 properties, it's impossible not to make a few mistakes, which is actually right. And he said, the company has completed 12 billion of office refinancing since March 2020 and it has minimal debt maturing this year. And I did look up actually their debt maturities. I'm going to try to go through them and I hope you don't get confused. But this is from their annual report. So you can go back to their annual report for, I believe they put it up in March or April of 2023. And you could actually look at all the things I'm talking about. So these are the average interest rates, all right? It's around 5.3% for renewable, 6.5% for infrastructure. Private equity, 7.3%, and real estate was 6.1%. Now, this is more than double pretty much what they had last year. The average was around 4% in 2021. In 2022, it was around 6.4%, and now it's around 7%, I believe. Now, look at this. This is the average term for, for the debt. So when does it actually matures? Now, in 2022, if you look at the renewables, it's nine years. This is not bad at all. The infrastructure is around six years. The private equity is six years. The real estate is three years. And the total is five years. Now, three years for real estate, this is very, very bad. So if maybe interest rates stay high from now till 2024 or 2025, then what's really going to happen to Brookfield? And this is a better illustration to where Brookfield actually is. And this is the principal repayment on the property specific borrowings due over the next five years. In 2023, this is only for real estate. They have $31 billion due. $31 billion. 2024, they have 20 and a half billion. 2025, they have to have 12 and a half billion. 2026, 6.2 billion. 2027, 7.8 billion. And after 2027, they have like 9 billion. But pretty much 70 or 80% of the entire debt is due over the next three years. And I don't know how what Brookfield is going to do. And this is just real estate. It's not even, you know, accounting for infrastructure and the other. For example, like renewable power is most of it is actually due after you know, uh, something like uh, 2027. It's the same for infrastructure, same with private equity. But the real estate portfolio, this is a big uh, problem in my opinion. And I hope I'm not missing anything, but this is very, very bad for Brookfield. And I don't really like what I'm seeing. If the Fed doesn't cut rate anytime soon, they cannot refinance them at the lower interest rates that they had. If they finance them higher, then earnings are going much, much lower and the stock is gonna keep crashing. And there's a lot of, you know, risks with uh, Brookfield. And I know I'm gonna get a lot of you in the comments saying yes, but this is non-recourse debt, which means Brookfield can just walk away from the loan and there's no repercussion on the company whatsoever. Then the bank is just back holding the loan and then Brookfield just got away free and clear. And I do get it and I do understand this uh, 
uh, thing, and I believe you're right about it. But if this issue keeps happening, and if you believe that Brookfield can just walk away from every single deal without this actually affecting their name, their reputation, their business, or even their credit profile, then you're delusional in my opinion. Why else is the stock actually going down? This is the answer that pretty much no one was able to answer on Twitter. I asked people that, you know, write me in the comments. I said, why is the stock going down? They don't know why. Well, this is why the stock is going down. And I'm trying to be fair in this video on giving also the bearish case on a company. I don't just talk about the bullish case. If you believe that there's no bearish case with Brookfield, yes, you haven't done your research. And I hope this video actually helped. And I hope you didn't think that I'm some perma bear or something for saying that. I'm just trying to outline the risks with the company and to talk about why the stock is even going down. And I actually tried to value this company and look at their metrics, but it's very, very complicated as we talked about many times. For example, the net income, it used to be 2.9 billion in 2022. Now the net income is only 424 million. But Brookfield uses something called, you know, uh, something like distributable earnings, something like adjustable distributable earning or something. And even though if you look over here, this is the net income we talked about 2.9 versus 424. Now, even if net income was so much lower between 2022 and 2023, their distributable earnings were pretty much the same. Now, I don't know how they even did those adjustments. They pretty much, in my opinion, just do whatever to try to show up the distributable earnings as looking you know, pretty much amazingly well. But most of the adjustments actually came from depreciation and amortization, which I'm not sure if this is the best way to value Brookfield, but I don't really like to value them on such numbers. I tried to value them on net income. The company was trading like 31 or 32 times earnings, which was uh, very, very uh, expensive. But if we look at something like the price of FFO funds from operation, which could be again manipulated, but this is the only thing I have on my ticker terminal, it's actually trading somewhere pretty close to the COVID lows, much, much lower than where it was trading at for the past 10 or 15 years. And it's showing actually that Brookfield Corporation is undervalued despite all the risks that we actually listed. And looking at their own guidance, they are guiding those uh, adjustable earnings to be 28% in terms of CAGR from 2022 to 2027. Now, in this case, if that ever happened, Brookfield is going to be growing amazingly well. The share price is going to go up a lot. But from all the risks that I highlighted in this video, I'm just not seeing how you know it's going to happen. I believe they're going to have a lot of trouble before things actually do get better. But Brookfield themselves, they said they are a corporation that they are focused on compounding capital over the long term for 15% every single year. So if I had to guess on where the return will be, it would be likely 15% or below every single year for Brookfield. So for me, Brookfield, it does look like it's undervalued from the price of FFO. If you use their adjustable distributable earnings, it also does look undervalued, but there's a lot of risks around the company. And I don't believe any of you or anyone can pretty much do a entire analysis alone and have a thousand percent conviction that they don't have anything wrong or they're not missing anything. So therefore, if I'm buying Brookfield right now and I have a general idea of the risks, I have a general idea that the stock is undervalued, I'm not going to have enough conviction to actually be buying dips. I'm going to doubt the thesis a lot of times. So I don't really understand it very well because it's just, it's very complicated. It's massive. So for me personally, despite the real estate risks and a lot of things that I talked about, I believe Brookfield is actually not a buy. But I could be making a mistake because Monish Pabrai is buying Brookfield and other big investors are buying Brookfield, but I try for me not to let them actually affect my own analysis. So based on my own analysis, I am not buying Brookfield, but if I was a 20, 30, 40 year type of investor, for me, I would be buying Brookfield here and maybe dollar cost average down if it goes to 24 or $22 per share. But for me personally, Brookfield is actually not a buy. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please press the like button and maybe consider subscribing. So I hope to see you in another video.